Hello, and uh, welcome to my presentation entitled Genome Engineering to Introduce a Fluorescent Reporter into Human Pluripotent Stem Cells to Study Cardiac Disease. My name is Lise Muncy, and I'm a development scientist at CCRM. I obtained my PhD in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Science at McMaster University and held a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at UBC. At CCRM, I oversee a variety of projects related to IPSC derivation, directed differentiation, and genome engineering. To start, I'd like to give an introduction to CCRM. We are a not-for-profit organization supporting the development of technologies that accelerate the commercialization of stem cell-based products and therapies. We were founded in 2011 with funding from the Canadian federal government that was matched by industry and academic institutions. In 2016, we expanded our services and team with a $40 million collaboration between CCRM, GE Healthcare, and the Government of Canada, and our new team consists of both scientists and business development professionals operating in a new state-of-the-art 40,000 square foot facility that has 20,000 square feet of space allocated to a GMP facility for cell manufacturing. Today I'll be talking to you about some of the work my team does. At CCRM, we have successfully implemented a variety of standardized workflows for our pluripotent stem cell program. This allows us to perform IPSC line generation and genome editing routinely. However, we also perform custom contract research and technology development in the pluripotent stem cell space. The focus of this presentation is on our established core facility for the derivation of IPSCs from patient samples and subsequent gene editing to create new lines for disease modeling, drug discovery, and future clinical applications. We are additional, additionally working on scalable solutions for pluripotent stem cell expansion and directed differentiation, and this is for applications that require large batches of consistently high-quality cells, such as drug screening or cell therapy. Establishing a human IPSC production facility was one of the first projects that we started at CCRM. Now operational for five years, the group specializes in reprogramming using non-integrating methods in feeder-free conditions, and we have experience with a variety of donor drive cell types. We've now delivered successfully over 100 cell lines representing more than 10 disease models to scientists and clinicians across Canada. We are also conducting projects to perform gene corrections on these lines using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and have successfully gene corrected single disease causing point mutations in IPSCs for three different disease models. The rapid advancements in genome editing have made the possibility of this scarless gene corrected IPS lines a possibility. At TCRM, we utilize both Talon and CRISPR technology to edit human pluripotent stem cells. We have successfully produced both feeder-dependent and feeder-free lines, including gene knockouts, different reporter cell lines, as well as I mentioned previously, single nucleotide polymorphism corrections to produce isogenic lines. Today I'm going to describe our workflow and a specific project we did working on one of these reporter cell lines. Our current workflow for contract gene editing takes approximately six months. At CCRM, we perform all steps of the project, from design um, of the project and reagents, and testing them, to final characterization and validation of the corrected or modified line. The project I'm going to tell you about today is a cell line that was developed for Dr. Michael Aflam, a scientist and clinician affiliated with the University of Toronto. Dr. LaFlem's research aims to use human pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes in ischemic heart disease, and he's a leader in this field. One of the aims of his research project is to improve the electrophysiological properties of pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, and he contracted CCRM to make him a reporter cell line to help him do this. The Quasar 2 protein is a fluorescent reporter of membrane depolarization. The project plan was to insert this fluorescent protein into a safe harbor locus in the genome. Here it would be stably expressed and it can be used to monitor action potentials in cardiomyocytes. Our workflow is broken down into two parts. To maximize our gene editing success, we perform a lot of legwork making sure our cell line is prepared for gene editing protocols 
and that our reagents are working efficiently. Once designed, each reagent is tested in a host of in vitro assays in a control cell line before moving into pluripotent stem cells. The first thing we had to do for this project was choose a site for integration. Broadly, a safe harbor locus is a place in the genome where a transgene can integrate and function in a normal and predictable manner. Although an ideal safe harbor locus wouldn't affect any gene or protein function, finding a perfect safe harbor locus in the genome is a challenge. The AAV S1 safe harbor locus is a well-defined site on chromosome 19. It has been used to create a host of reporter pluripotent stem cell lines, and these lines maintain their pluripotency and differentiation capacity after the site has been disrupted. There are also well-defined guide RNA sequences that have successfully been used to integrate transgenes into the site. For the creation of this line, we use the AVS1 T2 site. We use short oligos and the GeneArt CRISPR nuclease vector, and this all-in-one plasmid system was used to co-deliver the Cas9 nuclease and guide RNA being expressed off the same vector after just one simple cloning step. The next important part of the work is validation of the reagents. We use the genomic cleavage selection plasmid system to test the functionality and specificity of our chosen sequence and produced reagents. In this system, the target recognition sequence is cloned into a plasmid with a split orange fluorescent protein. If a double-stranded break occurs, um, this would allow the recombination and the repair of the plasmid, and this allows the orange fluorescent protein to be translated and detected by fluorescence. So by co-transfecting in this reporter plasmid, our nuclease and guide RNA, we can prove the functionality of our reagents. So shown here is an example of this assay. So in box one, this is just our control transfection of GFP. In box two is the selection plasmid alone, and as you can see, there's almost no fluorescence. Box three is our selection plasmid plus the guide RNA that's specific for the sequence we cloned into the selection plasmid and our Cas9 nuclease. And finally, in box four, is the selection plasmid, this time with a point mutation in the guide RNA and our Cas9 nuclease. So it's a very specific assay. We then confirm our guide RNA sequence works on the intended target in the genome. We do this by using the genomic cleavage detection assay. This is similar to the surveyor or T7 nuclease mismatch specific nuclease assay. In this assay, the CRISPR reagents are delivered to the cell line in which they are meant to work and allowed to act for 48 to 72 hours. At this point, the cells are lysed and a PCR around the cleavage site is performed. Following this, a simple program on the PCR machine leads to the random reannealing of PCR products. If there are products that had underwent random indel formation after cleavage, they will anneal to wild-type PCR products. This mis mixture is then subject to a mismatch-specific nuclease, and the product can be run on a gel. If there are multiple bands indicative of cleavage, then you can be confident that your guide RNA works in vivo. And this gives us a chance to optimize our best delivery conditions for the guide in that specific cell line. Here's an example of what that assay looks like. So the top gel is just our PCR after we've delivered um, all the reagents to the cell lines and extracted genomic DNA. After genomic cleavage, in row one, you can see we get, this, we get a cleavage product showing, and this is in the line where we transfected our guide RNA in Cas9. And then in lane two, again, this is where we did our nonspecific guide RNA with a single point mutation. So again, a very specific assay that proves to us our reagents are working. At this point, we're confident to put them into the IPS line or the um, ES line that we're about to uh, subject to gene editing. So now that we know our reagents work, we can go through the actual gene editing process. Although the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 has produced a reproducible method for obtaining modified cells, there are still so many technical challenges to overcome with this technology, especially when working with pluripotent stem cells. The workflow used at CCRM is fairly standard and includes the delivery of the gene editing reagents, the enrichment and clonal plating of cells, that had successful delivery, and then following this with colony picking and screening, and finally cell line characterization. 
I'm going to outline several challenges faced at each step of the process. This includes getting good delivery efficiency and survival during delivery, finding a robust method for enrichment of single um, pluripotent stem cells, survival of IPS or any PSCs as single cells, and finally, a high throughput method for screening a successful gene editing event. Thermal Fisher recently released a new media called StemFlex, which is meant to address many of these issues. So we compared the performance of this media to our standard feeder-free PSC expansion media at critical steps in the process. So I'm going to outline the process, and I'm going to outline those results now. We have found that electroporation is the most efficient and reliable way to deliver gene editing reagents to pluripotent stem cells, regardless of if you're using DNA, mRNA, single-stranded oligos, or protein. We have had a hard time getting cells to survive electroporation and recover back to an expansion phase. We performed a growth curve experiment after electroporation of gene editing reagents in these two mediums. We found that stem, in StemFlex there was an increased 24-hour viability after electroporation, shown in the graph on the left. And then we also found an increased daily viability, and that's in the top part of the graph shown here. And we also found that um, the cells recover and start expanding at a much sooner time point. So the slope of this line basically um, shows the expansion phase of the cells. After electroporation, we allow the cells to recover before single cell plating in selection media. We plate at a density that should allow single cells to settle and form colonies separate from one another in the selection media, in this case pyramycin. We again compared the performance of the two media systems at this critical step. We generally find that approximately 10 days after selection, colony growth is sufficient to perform colony picking. At this point in the experiment, there was about a third more colonies in the stem flex media, and the con colonies are significantly larger at day 10. This indicates a faster time to proliferation or expansion, and this is consistent with the results from our growth curve experiment. The next challenge in the process is having cells survive adhering to a 96-well plate for clonal expansion, and this is whether you do this through single cell sorting or manual clonal picking. In this case, we performed manual clonal picking. And as you can see here, again, we got an increased number of pick clones surviving the manual picking, and they expanded faster again in the stem flex medium compared to our standard media. At this point, we have clonal lines growing, and we use different strategies for ass assessing successful homologous recombination. For this line, we were able to use a simple PCR screen on extracted genomic DNA from each clone. One primer, one primer is designed outside the vector homology arms, and one primer is designed inside the transgene. Although there was no difference in the approximate percentage of clones, shown here, that underwent a homologous recombination event, we had more positive clones overall in the stem flex media, so 45 to choose from versus 22 in the stem flex system. This is because of the increased number of clones that survived the whole process. Once we've selected clones that are putatively positive and growing well, we expand them and further genetically characterize them. First, we sequence the integration site of both the left and right arms of the integrated transgene. We perform PCR screening for residual donor plasmid or random integration into the genome. Sometimes this is advantageous and sometimes this is to be avoided. And finally, using bioinformatics, we find the genomic sites most likely to be affected by off-target cleavage of our guide RNA, and we sequence these sites. Following this, the line is re-characterized to make sure they have maintained high-quality stem cell properties. This includes pluripotency analysis, looking at gene and protein expression, directed differentiation to ensure the line can still differentiate to all three germ layers, and karyotype analysis to ensure the line is chromosomally normal. 
The Quasar 2 line passed all of our quality controls, and this line is currently being characterized for functionality. At this point, cDNA has been made from extracted RNA, and three characterized clones all show that Quasar 2 is being successfully transcribed. Fluorescent recordings have also been performed in cardiomyocytes derived from these cells. The changes in the Quasar 2 fluorescent signal matches the electrophysiological signature of fluovolt, a membrane potential dye in the beating pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. These lines can now be used in Dr. LaFarm's research program for improving the electrophysiological properties of these cells. This is moving towards a cell therapy program and treatment for heart disease. Thank you very much.